Good morning. Good morning. As you've probably already heard, those who have been in the sanctuary for a while, we're just working out some bugs with the sound system, and uh, I, I hope and pray that, that those, it's all working now. We're all online. Thank you. Um, we uh, want to certainly welcome everyone who's joining us over CKBW Radio. Uh, this service is being uh, recorded on January the uh, 8th, but will air on CKBW on January the 15th. And so uh, we just want to welcome all those who are listening over CKBW Radio. Today's service uh, is being broadcast in memory of parents Harold and Evelyn Jefferson and husband Donald Sh uh, Chute by Nilda Chute. As well, I want to uh, just uh, recognize our communion this month uh, was sponsored by Bob and Todd and Ruby Wilson Todd. And we want to thank you for that sponsorship. As we uh, um, begin our service this morning, just a few announcements to share uh, as we look ahead into the, the month before us. Uh, if you're watching online or listening over radio, you can always find our bulletins at bridgewaterbaptist.com. And there you can click on the newsletter, and that's where we, we always post a bulletin. And you can also subscribe and get, receive one in your email each, each week. Um, one of the things that didn't make it into the bulletin in time this week was uh, the sad news that uh, Mackie, or uh, Malcolm, Aubrey Smith passed away. I know as many of you remember Mac, or uh, Mac and Doris, who've been a part of our church for many years. Mac was 93, and he passed away in a care home in Halifax. Uh, his funeral will be taking place this Tuesday, January the 10th, at the Corkums, uh, R.A. Corkum's Funeral Home in Wildville. Uh, the, there will be visitation with the family at 12.30 and the funeral service at 1.30 p.m. That's on Tuesday uh, afternoon, January the 10th. We have uh, a number of uh, just uh, postponements and uh, cancellations coming up this week because of illness. There's quite a bit of illness going in the community. And we wanted to let you know that our choir practice has been pushed ahead to January the 17th. It won't be meeting this Tuesday as our choir director is sick. Also, Janet Jodry's Bible study will be beginning on Wednesday, January the 18th at 10.30 a.m. Again, we're just pushing that ahead one week. Our uh, Sunday morning adult uh, uh, class uh, begins next Sunday, January the 15th, or if you're listening over radio today, and uh, we're going to be st starting on January the 15th at 9.30 a.m. for a three-week class on Christian faith, baptism, and membership. And whether or not you're a member in a Baptist church, or maybe you've thought about it, or you're interested, uh, maybe you're new here, or you've been here a long time, it will be an interesting discussion to be a part of over those three weeks as we talk about what are the, what are the fundamentals, what does it mean to have Christian faith? What is the, the significance of baptism, and why be a member of a local church? And you can be a part of those uh, studies, uh, those three, uh, the next three Sundays, beginning on January 15th at 9.30 a.m. here at Bridgewater Baptist Church. Lots of announcements in the bulletin. I hope you have an opportunity to read it through so that you can be a part of what's going on in the life of this church and then amongst the churches in this community. As we begin our worship service this morning, I want to thank uh, uh, Yvette Fisher and our worship team who have made uh, a lot of last-minute changes to come in as uh, our uh, choir director, our music director is ill. And so I'm going to invite them to come to the stage as I open in prayer as we begin our service this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks at the beginning of this new year, as we enter into 2023, that we are a part, Lord, of your life, your life-giving spirit moving through us because we've received you in faith. God, we thank you that it is that gift that we celebrated at Christmas, your coming into the world, that demonstrated your love for us, that you are willing to become flesh, to become one of us, to live among us and to die on our behalf on a cross. And that Jesus would not remain in the grave, but would conquer death, would conquer the grave and rise again. Oh God, it is that hope that fills us this morning, knowing that you take things which were broken, things that were dead, and you bring them to new life. Oh God, we look forward to what you will do in this new year, in our lives and in this world. Oh come, Lord Jesus, come. We praise you now. In Christ's name we pray. Let's stand together as we sing our first song of worship, The Splendor of the King.
Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away, all have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? Do they devour my people as though eating bread? They never call on the Lord. But they are there, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor. For the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. This is the word of the Lord. Today we continue our series, uh, Life-Giving Conversations. It's a series of uh, reflections that we're sharing over these uh, weeks in February and uh, January and February uh, about uh, how we talk about God, how we talk about faith. Um, If you uh, are joining us today for the first time over radio or over um, uh, YouTube, you can always uh, go back and watch the uh, previous um, messages if you're interested in catching up on where we are in this series. Last week, we talked about how um, our conversations about God, uh, how we talk about God and how we talk about faith, tend to show up on this spectrum where you can focus on meaning and what you know, and you can focus on mystery and the unknowable. And there's a tension there, an inherent tension when you're talking about matters of faith between those two poles. And sometimes, in fact, after the service last week, a, a, a good friend came up to me and said, you know, when I hear the word tension, and I bet when a lot of people hear the word tension, we think of a problem to be solved. We don't like the feeling of being tense or being in a conversation where there's tension or a relationship where there's tension. But the reality is that tension often isn't a problem to be solved, but a reality to be embraced. We actually need tension in our lives. You know, tension is what is allowing me to walk. <laughs> it's the tension between the, my muscles and bones and the earth, you know, pushing off this push and pull against gravity that allows me to, to move through this world. If there was no tension in my body, I would be a blob. Well, I'm already a bit of a blob, but I would be a blob <laughs> on the stage, unable to do anything. Tension allows motion. Tension is dynamic. Tension gives us movement. It allows for change. It's, if there is life, there is tension. And so it is when we talk about our faith and we talk about our, our, our experience of God, there is, that tension should always be present between what we know and what we don't know, where there is meaning and where there is mystery. And when we collapse the, 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 that tension, Usually we're going to one of those poles. It's all mystery or it's all meaning the way that we would describe it. And often in the history of the church, when that happens, when someone tries to solve the tension, there is something that results from it. It's called heresy. (laughs) A heresy is an idea that I can boil down, I can reduce the mystery into a meaning that fits into something that I feel good about. I can master it. I can control it. And if we think we've solved all the mystery about faith or about God or about the world or salvation or life, chances are we've missed something. We've sacrificed something. We've compressed this complex, beautiful, amazing reality that God has made, and we've made it something that we can handle. And the danger is that we're actually giving up the true God or the the true reality, the true life we're called to, and we're making it something less. So that's really what we're looking at over these next five to six weeks. We're going to be looking at ways that we substitute or misrepresent God in the way that we talk about him in our culture, 
but also even within the church. Because there's some very common ways that God gets kind of squeezed into a little box that Christians are just as guilty of as, you know, anyone in our, in our society. We're going to be looking at some of those misrepresentations uh, and how Jesus would respond to them over these next few weeks. Now, one of the inspirations for this uh, series was a master class I took with Dr. Anna Robbins. Anna Robbins is the president of Acadia uh, Divinity College. In fact, you can go online and actually see some of uh, her lectures, and you can even uh, watch this uh, little series on um, what she called That's Not My God. And Anna's inspiration, so we're going to go back a little bit farther, her inspiration was a book that she used to read to her son. Here's the book. That's not my truck. It's one of those us-born books. And the idea of the book was there's, you know, this little bird is flying around with this little mouse, and they come to a truck, and he goes, well, that's a truck, but that's not my truck. This truck is too squashy or squishy, or that truck is too big, or that truck's too small, and they make their way trying to figure out and find the truck. Well, in the same way, in that vein of the us-born children's book, we're going to be looking at that's not my God. That God is two, and we're going to fill in the blank each week. You get the, the setup, how it works? Now, Anna, <clears throat> as she shared, I think she had about, I don't know, nine or ten different ways that God gets misrepresented. And I'm going to um, introduce a few more that she didn't talk about, and I'm going to pick a few of the ones that she did talk about. The first one, though, I think is probably is foundational, and it's this. That's not my God. That God is is too silly. So that's our reflection this morning. That's not my God. That God is too silly. Now, for those who are actually watching on YouTube or here in the sanctuary, you got a picture in the center there. Have you ever seen this picture before? Can, no, it's, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Anyone know the name of it? It's yeah, the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Yeah, okay, now you know. The flying spaghetti monster. Now you might be saying, oh, that is kind of silly. Like, who, who actually talks about a flying spaghetti monster? Well, the flying spaghetti monster actually became popularized around, you know, about 10 years ago, around 2013, by uh, the uh, new atheist Richard Dawkins. And, and, and Dawkins was having uh, a series of debates with Rowan Williams, who was the uh, then Archbishop of Canterbury, and uh, talking about atheism and uh, theism, theism, the belief in God, atheism, the, re the rejection of belief in God. And uh, in that debate, uh, um, uh, Dawkins says, belief in God is a betrayal of the intellect. In other words, you have to leave your brain at the door if you're going to say that you believe in God, according to Dawkins. He will later go on and he will say that believing in God is as ridiculous as believing in a flying spaghetti monster. Now, he didn't invent the flying spaghetti monster. It was another uh, 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 writer who threw out this crazy image, but he grabbed a hold of it and he made it very popular. In fact, you can, if you happen to have people in your life who you love who happen to be atheists or love to argue ab about, uh, about faith, you might have heard of the flying spaghetti monster. It's one of those images that actually get put on bumper stickers. Some people wear t-shirts, coffee mugs with the flying spaghetti monster. And uh, it's a way of kind of mocking Christian faith. According to Dawkins, any real thinking person should surrender the backwards Bronze Age belief in a god. And when you're a kid, maybe it's okay, says Dawkins, to believe in fairies or monsters or mythical creatures, fantastic beasts for all the Harry Potter fans. But that's childish. You leave that behind when you enter adulthood. No, you should stop worrying about God. Just go and enjoy your life. And, and that becomes really the mantra of, uh, of Dawkins. Just forget about this business of God. Enjoy your life. And there's a whole movement now that has kind of followed him. In fact, you can actually visit a church to the, of the fly, flying spaghetti monster and uh, they've, they've gone about trying to remake a lot of Christian art. Here's Michelangelo's The Creation of David. I put in the, the little rectangle there. Um, <clears throat> the flying spaghetti monster. Now, when I saw this, now Anna used the word silly. I think I have a better word. I think that it is ridiculous. 
It's ridiculous. And I think Dawkins would probably like the word ridiculous. The word ridiculous literally means that which deserves ridicule, that which should be scorned, that which is absurd, utterly foolish. Actually, I think this is a biblical way of looking at the flying spaghetti monster, utterly foolish. So this is not my God, or that's not my God. That God is ridiculous. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Now, when Anna Robbins talks about uh, the arguments of the atheist uh, Richard Dawkins, she says this whole flying spaghetti monster thing, there's two mistakes. Dawkins makes two errors. And so I want to share with you her two responses, then I want to talk about them, and then we're going to open up the New Testament, actually we're going to open up the Bible, Old and New Testament, really briefly, and look at some biblical responses to the flying spaghetti monster. Believe it or not, I found them. <laughs> Here we go. The rationalist Dawkins has two errors. The first error, according to Anna, is that he's making a categorical mistake, a categorical error, suggesting the notion of God is just like belief in fairies or the Loch Ness Monster. And second, his second error is to say that he casts belief in God as a rational concept and ignores the existential power of belief in God, how belief in God actually impacts our daily lives. It's, Dawkins is treating the experience of God as if it's just an idea on a page and misses the lived reality, the existential experience of a relationship with God. So we're going to look at those two things really briefly. First of all, the categorical mistake. Now, that's, these are very philosophical-sounding terms, but let's just make it very easy. Anyone watch the hockey games this last week? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Team Canada. <laughs> All right. Woo! All right. <laughs> um, my, I know that this is an exciting time because I had many conversations with my, with my father's, father this week, all beginning and ending about hockey. <laughs> if you had moved to Canada and you heard all of this buzz about this game, ice hockey, and you'd never seen or played ice hockey before in your life, okay? You might say, oh, I want to learn this game. Every, these Canadians seem to love it. So let's imagine that this person, never had been in Canada before, anywhere in the north, gets brought out to learn how to play ice hockey. Here's a nice vintage picture of kids out playing on the ice. And so someone says to this young person, okay, this is how the game of hockey works. It's all about team spirit, okay? And you've got these players, we'll call them forwards, and this is what their job is. And then there are defensemen, and this is what their job is. And then there's the goalie. Very difficult job, only one on the whole ice, but this is the goalie's job. And then they talk about stick handling and shooting and blocking. And at the end, this person puts on the pair of skates and is gonna get out there and start to learn how to play ice hockey, but it says, wait a minute, Wait a minute, who's in charge of the team spirit? Whose job is that? That is a categorical mistake. Because team spirit is not a skill or responsibility of any one player, the forward, the defenseman, or the goalie, right? The team spirit is something else. It's more intangible. It's about the attitude of all of the players working together. The encouragement with one falls the others want them to stand up. When one scores, they all celebrate because that victory from that one person is a victory for everybody. Team spirit is not the same as being the goalie or stick handling or shooting. It's of a different category. And so, yes, throughout history, there have been a lot of people who have actually put belief in something that would be seen as ridiculous. Uh, Sir Cohen... Doyle, I don't want to mess up his name, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle actually believed in fairies. You know, maybe some of you know the stories of these little girls playing in their garden and taking paper cutouts, and one of the sisters actually got one of these early cameras and started playing with it and took the pictures of the fairies in England, and that there were people in the 1800s who actually believed there were fairies because of these false pictures. They would later be greatly embarrassed that they'd been fooled by the sisters. 
And yes, there are people who will travel to Loch Ness looking for the monster. But most people know that it's not real. And even there are people who will go looking for Sasquatch, Windigo, Bigfoot, the abominable snowman, the Yeti. I've actually found the Yeti to be a very good uh, thermos, and I, I have not a better coffee mug. But other than that, none of us really are looking for a Yeti or a Bigfoot. It is a categorical mistake to say belief in God is the same as fairies or the abominable snowman or a flying spaghetti monster. God is in a totally different category. Practically no one believes in a flying spaghetti monster or Bigfoot or Nessie. The existence of God, the creator and the sustainer of life, is far more complex and far more universally accepted. You can go to any culture, anywhere in the world, and you will find people who innately believe that there must be a creator, an intelligent, benevolent force, a start in the beginning of all life, a grand designer who is behind all of the universe and all reality. Even in countries that have banned religion, you think of, of, of China that officially was to be atheist, there are more Christians in China far more now than Canada because people are born with this innate longing, a desire to know God, their creator. You can't dismiss that. It's not the same as fairies or the abominable snowman. The other thing I think is important to recognize is that no one, not only no one, no one seriously believes in the flying spaghetti monster, FSM, there is no historic witness for the existence of the flying spaghetti monster. There is no textual evidence or his, of historic belief in a flying spaghetti monster. No one has ever claimed to have appeared in history as the representative of the flying spaghetti monster. And even more importantly, no one has ever been willing to give up their life, to sacrifice, even, even to die as a martyr because of their service to the flying spaghetti monster. Why? Because the flying spaghetti monster is ridiculous. Thank you. Our faith is completely different. Our faith in Jesus Christ is based on a historical reality that there is no legitimate historian in the world who would say that Jesus of Nazareth did not exist. It's a historical fact. There's more evidence for the existence of Jesus than there is of Napoleon or Alexander the Great or any of these other great figures in history that we, we believe, we, we would say we know existed. Jesus existed. Now, the claims of his miracles and the claims of his resurrection, yes, people will debate it. But according to historical texts, we have thousands of people who witness the resurrected Jesus. That is in a different category from the flying spaghetti monster. And not only has there been historic and documented evidence about who Jesus was, but clear documented evidence of the people who believed in him and are willing to give up everything, family and career and job and life and security, because what they encountered, their experience of Jesus and God's spirit in their life completely transformed them. That is not anything to brush off like a flying spaghetti monster. Just because someone says, I don't believe, they can't then make this claim, well, because I don't believe, it's foolish to believe. They need to look at the evidence, and a flying spaghetti monster does not do justice to the spiritual reality that is inherent in the human experience. And as Christians, when we and confront atheism, we also we can point to the fact that whether someone is a Muslim or J grew up Jewish or Hindu or any of the number of other faiths in the world, there is this core conviction that we all share that there is a God who made us, that we will be accountable to this God, and that this God desires us to live at peace with one another. 
there is common ground for us to be able to stand, even with people of other faiths, and say, okay, on these things we do agree. And the, the position of Dawkins is the overwhelming minority in human history. The second thing that uh, Anna says is that Dawkins' error is a mistake in thinking that God is just a rational concept and misses or ignores the lived existential power, which just means the experienced power of belief, the way that belief in God impacts our daily life. Um, for Dawkins to basically say, I don't believe in this whole God thing, therefore belief is stupid, so just forget about God and enjoy your life, is kind of out of touch with reality. And Dawkins gets called on this by uh, Christians and just theists often in debate. Forget about God and just enjoy your life? Think about that for a second. Forget about God and just enjoy your life. As if belief in God somehow stifles or destroys life. I don't know about you, but during the uh, pandemic, Eric and I uh, got to watch that eight hours of footage that uh, Peter Jackson had of the Beatles. Did any of you get to see that? It was, uh, what's the name of the song? Anyway, it's all right. Uh, but it was their last set in studio before they did that big performance on the rooftop in, in London, right? And I remember watching that, and then Eric and I just, this is the kind of thing that happens. Maybe this has happened to you. You're like, oh man, I want to listen to more Beatles. <laughs> and then we watch another documentary on the Beatles, and then we watch another documentary, and then we're just playing Beatles music all the time. It stopped, but th there was a period there. We, all we were doing was listening to Beatles music. Do you know, do you remember the song Imagine? John Lennon, Oko, uh, they wrote Yoko Yono, Oko Yono? <laughs> Yoko Ono, Yoko Ono, thank you, thank you. So John Lennon, Yoko Ono write this song Imagine, which is really, it's a beautiful song, but have you ever really thought about the lyrics of it? Imagine there is no heaven, no religion too. And the idea that if we could just get rid of all that, we'd all live in peace. Man, that is a fantasy. That is a flying spaghetti monster. Because history has told us, in any society that's tried to push out all religion, peace is the last thing that comes about. Our natural state in this broken world that we live in is not just to get along and be nice to each other. Oh, there is a brokenness within humanity that we need God to heal and when God is working, when you find a community of faith, well, that's where you find forgiveness. That's where you find generosity, self-giving love, putting others before yourself. But when God is taken out of the picture, that is not the state that we just naturally move towards. Removing faith does not immediately bring us to peace. Nothing wrong with all, some of the other Beatles songs, but that one. <laughs> no disrespect. For Dawkins, the claim that you should just enjoy your life, forget about God, also is a very callous way, it's a very narrow way of looking at the world because for most people living on this planet, life is very difficult. For most people here in Bridgewater, life isn't easy. And from the outside, it might look easy, but every one of us are dealing with broken relationships, with a need for forgiveness, with addiction, with anger, with resentment, with so many mental and emotional and social and economic problems. Just enjoy your life. And then you go and you, you spend time with people who are really, really experiencing true poverty. Just enjoy your life. There's nothing wrong with pleasure and enjoyment. I think God has given us pleasure and enjoyment as a gift. And through this season of Christmas, I hope you got to enjoy and experience pleasure in music and in food and in storytelling and all of the good things that are a part of the, of the festive season. But enjoyment and pleasure are one emotion, one element, one note in a good life. Life isn't all about pleasure. Something that is all about creating pleasure, well, we have a word for that. It's a product. Your life is not a product. Amen? And a good life 
Well, it will span the full range of emotional experiences. Saying that life should just be about pleasure is like saying that, well, every beach should look like Crescent Beach. Every color should be purple. <laughs> every meal should include ice cream. Actually, every meal should include ice cream. I'm a total believer in that. Every play should be by Shakespeare. Really? A true life has a span of emotions. I, I just, in preparing today, I just wrote down a bunch, but we could fill this with probably a hundred words. But a real life, there is the emotional experience of empathy and compassion and reverence and sorrow and courage and grief and hope and joy. Pleasure alone doesn't make a good life. In fact, it makes a very selfish and small life. We are called to live good lives. For the one whose uh, beloved has left into an uncertain future, they've gone to war or they've been called out to sea or whatever, it would be callous for me to say in their worry and concern, just enjoy your life. For the parent who has lost a child, for the spouse who is now the caregiver for their husband or wife, because of their cancer or because of whatever ailment. For the, for the person who's been working a double shift on a medical team and they won't go home because they know if they go home that these people won't be cared for. For the individual struggling with addiction. For the person fake, facing bankruptcy. The worst thing you can say is, forget about God, just enjoy your life. These are times in our, all of our lives when it makes emotional sense to experience the moving of God in our lives. And it is unhelpful, and it is shallow, and it is callous, just to brush that aside and say, oh, come on, just enjoy your life. What does the Bible say to the flying spaghetti monster? Or Dawkins' idea that, oh, just forget about God, enjoy your life. It actually says quite a bit, but for our time, I'll be quick. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to refer to four passages. In the Old Testament, there is often description of someone who has given up belief in God. When the Bible speaks of someone rejecting the existence of God, it consistently makes two points. And, and I think these two points also translate into the parables and the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. So what are the two points? What are the two things that God says if someone was to say, belief in God is like believing in a ridiculous spaghetti monster? Well, the first thing the Bible says is very clear, that atheism is ridiculous. <laughs> Literally, that's the passage that Emma read today. Or if you were to go to Psalm 10, Psalm 10 says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, there is not room for God. God is too big for his mind. And then in the passage that Emma read, Psalm 14, the fool says, the fool, the ridiculous one, the one who doesn't, who doesn't see reality, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, remember, this whole series is about life-giving conversations. And if I'm sitting down having coffee with someone whose argument against God is a flying spaghetti monster, it's probably not very helpful for me to say, no, you're ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, do you remember Pee Wee Herman? Do any of you remember that series? Pee Wee was known for getting into arguments with Francis, this kid next door. And the argument would always devolve into, I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> you're ridiculous. No, you're ridiculous. No, you're ridiculous. No, you're ridiculous. No, you're ridiculous. Infinity. That is not a very good conversation. <laughs> so I probably wouldn't go there with someone who is trying to struggle with belief in God and say, well, no, no, you're ridiculous. But as a person of faith, that, is, that truly is what the Bible's first response is to atheism. To live as if there is no God is ridiculous. It goes against the way that we were made, the way that we were wired, and it goes against what it means to be a part of a good life and to live a good life. But the second thing, the second point that's made very clearly in the Old and the New Testament is that when someone lives as if there is no God, it corrupts the soul. It breaks something within us. If we live as if there is no God, 
And I, I intentionally word it that way, live as if there is no God, because there's many people, even within the church, there's many people who claim to be a part of a, of a faith community, but the way they live their lives is as if God doesn't exist. The Bible has a lot to say about that. When someone lives as if God doesn't exist, there is no humility. The, the, the lack of humility in acknowledging that there is a higher power, that there is a, a standard and authority above us, wow, it, it does something to us. It makes us feel that the world's, world's all about us. It's all about me. And then when the Old Testament, like those two Psalms, describe that kind of life, it says the person who lives that kind of life will waste their life pursuing pleasure and they will devour other people like bread. Other people become a means to your own pleasure and you miss the dignity and the, and, and the humanity and the other people in your life and in your community and in the world. That's what Jesus gets at when he's speaking to his disciples. There's quite a few parables where Jesus talks about someone who lives as if there's no God. If I was to give two examples this morning, I would first share about that, that story of the unjust judge. It's a story that we've talked about at least once here at Bridgewater Baptist. It's in Luke chapter 18. The unjust judge who continually says, he kind of mutters to himself, I don't fear God and I don't care about men. Basically, the unjust judge, Jesus' parable in Luke 18, is all about, I want to take care of myself. And I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make sure that I eat first and that my needs are met and I pursue pleasure. And when Jesus describes the unjust judge, we see that this is someone who uses the system and the, 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 the structures of the world to push down the poor, to oppress those on the margins, to lift themselves up. And that is not true life. Another example that Jesus gives is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And this is in Luke uh, chapter 16. And in the story of rich man and Lazarus, again, the rich man is a religious man. Supposedly, he's Jewish. He's a part of that community. But he lives as if there is no God. He's all about worrying and making sure that he is being taken care of. And right at his gate, there is a man in need, Lazarus, the beggar. And he doesn't see the need that is right there on his doorstep. And when he dies, as Jesus tells the story, the rich man receives for all of his narrow way of living nothing but torment. And in the story, as Jesus is, is telling the story, he looks across and he sees by Abraham's side, Father Abraham, Lazarus the beggar. This man who has been oppressed and pushed around and stepped on and has never received any help from the rich man. And the rich man, it's almost like the story of the Christmas carol. Like Jacob Marley cries out, oh, go and warn my brothers because, they, because I have lived as if there is no God they need to know. They need to know that the way they live their lives in that world matters so they don't end up like me. And of course, the response from Abraham, as Jesus tells this parable, is that they have Moses and the prophets. God has given them revelation, saying that God is real and that there's a way that we can live that leads to life and a way that we can live that leads to death. This is what Jesus is saying in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 8, when he says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, every pleasure under the sun, and loses his soul? There is nothing particularly new about the new atheists like Richard Dawkins and the arguments that have been existed really all the way back to the time of Jesus. The desire to mock faith the desire to, to, to act as if belief in God is something primitive, is something below us, something childish, isn't actually connected to the real lived experience of what it means to be a person of faith. Um, I don't know if any of you are looking for books to read over this winter, but um, there is some profanity in this book, be warned. <laughs> 
but I would really recommend it. If you have anyone in your life who is a, uh, you know, comes to discussions or conversations about faith and is kind of mocking and puts down faith in the way that Dawkins does, it's called Unapologetic by Francis uh, Stufford. And, uh, sorry, Spufford, <laughs> S-P-U-F-F-O-R-D. <laughs> and, and Francis's book, Unapologetic, basically is an argument that Christianity, Christian faith, makes emotional sense. And yes, you can't really argue anyone rationally whether or not to believe in God. Ultimately, it is a step of faith. But in our experience, it makes sense. It makes emotional sense. So I'd recommend that if you're interested in reading more on this topic. There's no doubt in history that there's been countless examples of people who are a part of the Christian church, we'll just stay within Christianity, who have done terrible things in the name of God. But those were people who were either living as if there was no God, or they were basing their actions and decisions on a misshapen, deformed picture of God. And we're going to be talking about that over the next four to five weeks. So if there's any Richard Dawkins out there, <laughs> stay tuned, come back. We want to talk about some of the things that I think are, are things that we as Christians we need to own up to that even within our own history we have allowed there to be some very misshapen views of God that have led some, to some very bad actions but for those in my experience who have a real genuine faith a deep and meaningful faith in Jesus Christ and the way that he presents his father it's transformational and it leads to a change in our lives that our lives are more rich and more full, that we become people filled with the things we talked about through Advent, peace, hope, joy, and love, that we become people who put our lives in service to others for the sake of our King. People who have been inspired by the redemptive work of God do a lot of good in this broken world, working for the well-being even of those who believe in a flying spaghetti monster. So, flying spaghetti monster. Yes, that is ridiculous, but that is not my God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you that, Lord, um, you come to us when we need you the most. In those moments, Lord, of quiet desperation, oh, Lord, when we are crying out to you for help, that, Lord, your spirit is there and present calling us to put our trust in you. I thank you, Lord, for the ways that in, even in my own life, there have been men and women, even young people, who out of obedience to Jesus have been so gracious and that, God, you have used them to bless and to help me at low moments of my life. And God, I thank you that each one of us have opportunity every day to follow you in faith, to recognize the Lazarus on our doorstep, to be able to be a part of bringing about true hope in the lives of people who are experiencing desperation. God, I pray for anyone today who's listening, who, Lord, has struggled with faith and struggled with doubt and has been lured into this thin character that believing in God is as ridiculous as believing in a flying spaghetti monster. Oh God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in their life right now that, Lord, you would be drawing them to really seeking after you. For Jesus tells us those who seek will find, those who ask will be answered, and those who knock, the door will be opened. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. If you'd like to stand and join us in singing a song that really does tell the power of God, How Great Thou Art.
forth into this new week, I pray that you will be blessed and that God's spirit will lead you in peace and to be an opportunity to be a force of God's love and grace in the lives of others. May we go forth now in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.